Again, my apologies for not being able to deliver this live. I'm still working on a solution to try to get to be able to deliver these lectures live. I have no idea if I'm going to be able to find one or not, but like I said, I apologize. It just was not going to happen today. Absolutely nothing was running on any device this morning. There was no way, you, there was no point in even trying anything with Zoom this morning. It was just a complete and utter fail around 8 a.m. So anyway, um, let's talk a little bit about sufficient statistics. So in the video that I asked you to watch, it gave you the definition of sufficient statistic. So let's just go through that again. So if you've got a statistic Y that is based on your random sample that you're choosing. So your book likes to use a function U, doesn't matter what the function name is. So you've got a statistic. So this function, again, is just based on whatever the random sample is. So some of the things that we've done, of course, that give us statistics are, you know, your mean, right? Your X bar is the sum of the X sub i's over N. This could be your, so your, your, this could be your U function where your U is, you take your random sample and you plug them into each of the spots of the sum and. So it just means add them together and divide by n. We've, of course, seen our s squared is um, 1 over n minus 1 times the sum of the difference of each x sub i minus x bar squared. These are just different examples. But again, this just gives you an idea of what we mean by a function of the random sample. You're plugging in the random sample into some statistic and doing a function of it. All right, so we say that y is sufficient for a particular parameter theta if the conditional probability, the probability that your x1 equals little x1, x2 equals little x2, so on to xn equals little xn, given that the y value is equal to some little y, if that probability does not depend on theta. Okay, so the idea behind this again is, okay, I've picked a random sample and I've calculated some statistic on it, okay? Now again, once I've calculated the st statistic, I have the value. Now, based on the fact that I have the value, what is the probability that I could deconstruct that particular value and get my random sample back? That's what this conditional probability is, right? I have a value. That value is a function of the x's, but if I know just a specific value the y is equal to, what's the probability that I could get that specific sample to give me that value back again? Okay, so... That's what this conditional probability is saying. But the important part is that once I know the value, if I try to calculate this probability, it doesn't depend on what the parameter is at all. Okay? It can depend on the x's, it can depend on the n, what have you. But the important part is that it cannot depend on theta. What that means is once I know the value, once I know the statistic, I've got every piece of information that I can possibly get about that about the parameter from that statistic because the probability that those x you remember the x's are coming from the underlying distribution that depends on the theta so the probability that I can actually get y from these x's right given that I have this y what's the probability that I actually get these x's it doesn't depend on this theta at all what that tells us is that, okay, I, my, I know what the probability is now, but I don't have anything that's dependent upon the theta. It doesn't depend on the distribution at all. It only depends on the actual specific values of the x. Okay, so that means that I can't get any more information about the theta out of it because it's gone from the probability. I'm just dependent that the only thing that I have left are the x's, the y's, what have you. Okay, all right, so... We used that definition, I know that definition is a little weird, but we used that definition to do the couple of examples that I did in the, the video that I asked you to watch before this. 
that definition is not exceptionally useful for us to actually figure out st uh, sufficient statistics for us because, again, we have to know what the statistic is. We have to know what the y is to be able to compute that uh, conditional probability, right? In both of the examples that I did in the video that I asked you to watch, the statistic was just the summation of the x sub i's. We don't always use the summation of the x sub i's for our statistic. Let me just look at that statistic that we have for the s squared. That statistic, I mean, there's a piece of it that involves the, the uh, summation of the x sub i's, but we also do a difference and we square it, right? There's not just a summation piece there. So there must be another way for us to be able to tell whether or not a statistic is sufficient. And actually, there are two of them. So the first one is what's referred to as the factorization theorem. And this is actually what your book uses as the definition for sufficient statistic. So what this is says that um, let's let our x1, x2 out to xn be a random sample. All right, so this random sample, remember it's all coming from the exact same uh, distribution, but since it's all coming from the same distribution, we have the same theta in our PDF for all of them, but they're all gonna depend, they, they're all get multiplied together because they're, they're independent of each other. So we write with joint uh, PDF or PMF, I'm only gonna write PDF in this case. So let's say we have the joint PDF and theta, but again, the way we're going to get this joint PDF is just to multiply the PDFs of the individual pieces together to get this because they're all independent. So the probability that they all happen is just the product of the product of each individual one has them, has it, or happens, I should say. All right. So then the y, which is the function of the random sample, is sufficient for theta if and only if, well, we can take this joint PDF and factor it into two pieces. There's a phi. which has a theta in it. Oops, now I, the book uses brackets here, so I guess I will too. And there's a phi that has a theta in it, and there's an h that doesn't have a theta in it. Okay. And more specifically is this theta, or excuse me, this phi that has the theta. Oops, I should have put the parentheses here. Sorry. Uh, this phi that has the theta in it, where I have the x1 out to x in, I could actually just replace it with the y instead. Okay, So that's where the second part of this says where phi depends on the x's only through u. And h does not depend on theta. All right, this is a lot of words. Okay, let's actually put this into use and hopefully do this for a couple of examples and we'll see what in the world we're even talking about. Okay, so let's go over to this first example. Um, and right away, they change their x's to y's. So we got this y1 to yn is random sample of size n from a distribution with that particular probability density function. And our goal is here to create a, let's find a sufficient statistic for theta. All right. Well, the first thing I'm going to do just to simplify our notation a little bit here because of what the definition we just had. I'm going to change all of these y's to x's just so that we can see this in terms of the factorization theorem that we just wrote. Okay. 
because the y is usually what we think of as the sufficient statistic. So just to rewrite this, we're going to have our f of x theta is 2x over theta e to the minus x squared over theta, where the x goes from 0 to infinity. Okay. I'm going to change the y's to x's just so that we can see it in terms of the factorization theorem. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take that joint, we're going to find that joint PDF, okay? So the joint PDF is this f of, this part over here, this f of x1, x2 out to xn. But again, this is a random sample of x's. So to find the joint PDF, I just now need to multiply all of these to get things together by putting in the x sub i. So our joint PDF in term, with the theta in it is just the product from i equals 1 to n of 2x sub i over theta e to the minus x sub i squared over theta. Okay, now in order to use the factorization theorem, I need to break this apart into a piece that has a statistic in it and a piece that has no thetas. Okay, so that's our goal to re using this particular theorem. I need to write a piece that has a function of the x sub i's, but as something that I can see as a statistic, and then a piece that I can just throw off to the side that doesn't matter. Because again, I'm trying to concentrate on the statistic. Okay. All right, so let's go back over here again. Here's my joint PDF. Let's just do the multiplication. Well, this says I gotta multiply all my thetas together, all my x's together, but I'm gonna get a summation here in my exponent, right? Because when I multiply these together, I add my exponents. So this will be two times the product of the x sub i's over theta to the n, because this is the same theta over and over and over again, e to the minus summation of the x sub i's over theta. All right, because I just add those all together. I add my exponents. Okay. So, now again, we're trying to break this apart into a piece that has theta into it, a piece that, or sorry, a piece that has theta, a piece that doesn't have theta. That's one of the first things we want to do is a piece that has theta, a piece that doesn't have theta. Well, I can break this into two pieces here. I can take this piece and break it apart. So I can write this as 2 pi x sub i, or not pi, this is 2 times the product of the x sub i's. I just didn't write the uh, indices there. This is still a product times 1 over theta to the n e to the, well now notice this is a, a over theta over an entire summation. So I can write this as minus 1 over theta summation of x sub i squared. All right, here's a piece that does not have theta. Here's a piece that has theta. And notice that really I could think of this as a single variable, as my y. Because then it would be e to the minus 1 over theta times a y. And then I have the only way that this depends on the x sub i's is through this y. So if you let the y equal that function of the x sub i squared, then I have the things that are what we need in the factorization theorem. You've got 2 product of the x sub i's, no theta, times 1 over theta to the n, e to the minus 1 over theta y, and this one has no x's essentially, because it was able to replace this with a single variable, a function of the x sub i's, so technically there's an x sub i's in there, but I replaced it with a y. So what that tells us is that we're using the factorization theorem that y is sufficient for theta. Let's do another example to try to illustrate this factorization theorem again. All right, so here's a longer one. This one actually has x's in it this time, so I won't rewrite the problem to start with. 
So we've got a random sample, again, from some other distribution that they give us, and they're asking us to find a sufficient, uh, find a sufficient statistic for theta. We're going to use the factorization theorem again to do this. So again, remember, the first step in using the factorization theorem is to write down the joint PDF, but the joint PDF again is an easy thing to do if you're given the PDF because all we're doing is taking the product of the PDF with individual X sub i's stuck in here. Okay, So we have the theta times theta plus 1 times X sub i to the theta minus 1 times 1 minus X sub i and multiplying each of those together. And again, the reason why we do this, random sample, they're all coming from the same di distribution. So each of the x sub i's has the same distribution as the underlying distribution. So its PDF is exactly the same, just with a different subscript. And then since they're all independent, we get the product of jointly, or excuse me, the probability of them being jointly happening is just the product of the probabilities that they individually happen. All right. So, now we're going to rewrite this so that we can break it apart into a piece with thetas and a piece without thetas. All right, so let's see. The first part, multiplying a bunch of thetas together gives me a theta to the n. Multiplying a bunch of theta plus 1s together gives me a theta plus 1 to the n. This is still going to be a product of things. And this one's going to be a product of things. This one's already pretty nicely written for us because this part has a theta in it. This part doesn't. So this second part here is going to be the H that's mentioned in our factorization theorem. See, we have the H with no thetas. This is going to be your H part. There's no thetas here. Okay. All right, so let's see if we can rewrite this a little bit. Well, each of these has the exact same exponent on it. So I can write that as the product of the x sub i is to the theta minus 1. Right? And then I still have this thing on the end, and I'm going to not write the indices on there because I'm lazy. But, so this part here that has no x's, the reason why it has, well, it has x's in it, but notice that this is a function of the x's. So let's let the y be the product of the x sub i's. Then I can think of this as a function of y where the x's have gone away. So by the factorization theorem again, y is sufficient for theta. All right, so the reason why the factorization theorem works here, uh, uh, the reason why the factorization theorem helps give you that uh, sufficient statistic is because if you know how the y is defined in terms of the x's, that conditional probability, you're going to be dividing out by the y piece. And what's going to happen is that this piece here that has all the thetas in it is going to be in your probability for your y's where they all divide out. Um, we did that in the other video where you saw that when we had the by the Bernoulli trials, the we knew the distribution for the y's was binomial, which had the p in it, and then when you divided it out, the p's went away. When we had the Poisson distribution, we know the sum of Poissons is Poisson, so when we divided out, the lambdas went away. It's the same idea here. If I know the, the know the distribution of x's here. I can figure out the distribution of the y's in terms of this statistic. It'll involve this theta in this fashion. If I divide by it, the thetas are going to go away. It's the whole point of this of why the factorization theorem works. When you've got it factored here, when you do your conditional probability, it's going to look like this piece with the phi in it, and it's going to divide out. That's the whole idea behind the factorization theorem. Okay. So anyway, we found our sufficient statistic here.
Let's look at this next one. But before we do this next one, let's look at this another way to talk about how we can find sufficient statistics. So one of the things that we can do is what's referred to as write this in exponential form. Okay, so this is a definition. We say that a PDF f of x given theta is of exponential form if we can write our PDF as e, so just our number, the regular old number e, to the k of x p of theta. So a product of a function of x, function of theta, split up. If you've had differential equations, this looks like a separable differential equation idea, right? Function of x, no thetas. Function of theta, no x, multiplied together. Okay. Plus function of x all by itself, no thetas, plus a function of theta, no x. Okay. That's what we mean by exponential form. Right. Let me do an example here before we talk about why we care about exponential form. So let's say our PMF, doesn't matter if PMF or PDF, is Poisson in this case. So we have lambda to the x, e to the minus lambda over x factorial. Well, I can write this as what? Well, I have to be a little bit clever to get it in exponential form, but we're all about being clever. e to the natural log of lambda to the x over x factorial, e to the minus lambda. And then combine, when we combine, we add the exponents. And then here, I can use my log properties to write as a subtraction. We're going to have e to the log of lambda to the x minus log of x factorial minus lambda. And then just to rewrite this first part again, we have e to the x log lambda minus log of x factorial minus lambda. Now let's look at the individual pieces. This Let me write it in a different color so you can see the different pieces. This is k of x. This is p of lambda. Lambda is playing the role of theta here. This is s of x. This is q of theta. We're interested in what the exponent looks like when we're talking about it being of exponential form. Okay. All right. Oops. This should be a lambda, not a theta. All right. So this is what we mean by exponential form. And usually we also require, and this is what the theorem is going to require, we also require that the support of X, uh, the, the, uh, the support here does not involve theta. Remember that when we had that distribution, when we had that distribution that X is uniform on zero theta, that weird one, when we were doing maximum likelihood estimators, this is the support here is not free of theta. The support here is not free of theta because the uh, what we can uh, the allowable x values here depend on what the theta is. So the support here is not free of theta. Okay, so. We're talking about the domain of the the the, pro, the domain of the probability density function where the probability is actually non-zero. The support part, that support can't have a theta in it. That's what we mean by free of theta. Okay, so the theorem here is that if x of uh, x in terms of the uh, the PDF in terms of x and theta is of exponential form and the support 
of f is free of theta, then the statistic, which is the summation of the k of x's, is sufficient for theta. Well, I should say the k of x of i is here, sorry. All right, so let's go back, look back up at the Poisson example. Here's the k of x, which are just your x's. So what this the theorem says is that the y equals the summation of the x of i's is sufficient, which is what we saw in the other video. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so let's go back over here and scroll down a little bit. We've got a gamma distribution here where we know alpha, but we don't know theta. So just treat alpha like it's a number here. Doesn't matter what that number is. Treat alpha like it's a number. And it wants us to find a sufficient statistic for, so this is part, the first part. Find a su sufficient statistic for theta if alpha is a number, is already known, okay? All right, so let's use this exponential form idea. All right, f of x, I want to write it as given theta, because I but we know what alpha is, so I'm interested in the theta part. All right, so this is 1 over gamma of alpha theta to the alpha, x to the alpha minus 1, e to the minus x over theta. Okay, well I have to do e to the natural log of this mess. Okay. And then combine it with the other one. Let me see if I can do this all in one step. We'll have e to the alpha minus 1 times natural log of x. <clears throat> Pardon me. That so I'm going to do e to the natural log of this piece. So then I have a natural log of a quotient, which means I'll do this part first, and I can bring the exponent down up front. So I've got alpha minus 1, natural log of x, minus natural log of a bunch of garbage, gamma of alpha theta to the alpha. So that, again, this is coming from writing this as e to the natural log of that piece. And then we have minus uh, 1 over theta, um, x to the, sorry, just an x, 1 over theta times an x, my bad. I got distracted there for a second. All right. Now, I wrote it this way purposefully because the second part says what if alpha is known and theta is not known. Okay, so in this case, alpha is known. So let's see if we can pick out the individual pieces for the exponential form. So remember, again, we have We'll write it up here at the top in red. e to the k of x p of theta plus s of x plus q of theta. That's the exponential form. Theta is the parameter I'm interested in here. Okay, so here, this part right here, has a theta but doesn't have an x. This is q of theta. This part here has an x but doesn't have a theta. This part is s of x. This part has x and theta, right? As x has theta. So here is k of x, here is p of theta. So according to the factorization theorem then, y equals summation of the x of i's is sufficient for theta. Okay. Not a huge surprise that the, some of those, uh, the uh, some of the x of i's would be sufficient for theta here. Because, notice again that if we know the alpha, we've got a piece here that looks like an exponential, and we know that the theta is the mean for an exponential, and this would be a way to calculate your mean. 
just do the sum of the x of i's and then divide by n. All right, what if instead we were looking for alpha, and a sufficient statistic for alpha, knowing theta? So let me just rewrite this down here again. F of x given or x of x in terms of theta is one over. Oops, no, not one over. Let's do the exponential part. Alpha minus one log of x minus log of gamma of alpha theta to the alpha minus one over theta times x. Now remember again, in this case, we're looking for alpha. This way I wrote a theta. I meant an alpha here. So your exponential form in this case would look like e to the k of x p of alpha plus s of x plus q of alpha, because alpha is the one we're trying to find a sufficient statistic for now. Okay, so let's look at this again. Alphas, no x's. This is q of alpha. Right? This is x, no alpha. Here's s of x. Here's function of x, function of alpha. So this is p of alpha, this is k of x. So using the factorization theorem, or excuse me, the exponential form theorem idea here, y equals the summation of the uh, natural log of x of i's is sufficient for alpha. So if you want a statistic to approximate your alpha here, no, if you know what theta is, then you can get a, a statistic that's sufficient for estimating your alpha by doing the log of each a num member of the sample and then um, the log of each member of the sample and then uh, summing it up. Or if you wanted to rewrite it, this would be the log of the product of the x sub i's be a way to rewrite it. And notice that you would get the same idea here if you were trying to do this using the factorization theorem with multiplying these all together. You would get the same kind of idea here. Um, let's ma let's uh, actually match that up. Let me see if I can find a blank spot to write in here. So let me go over to the side. All right. So we just had y is equal to the natural log, let's write it this way, sorry. The summation of the natural logs of x of i's is sufficient for alpha. And we got that from looking at the exp uh, exponential form. What if instead we did it with the factorization theorem? So our joint PDF for your gamma would be the product, i equals 1 to n, 1 over gamma of alpha theta to the alpha x sub i to the alpha minus 1 e to the minus x sub i over theta. This would be 1 over gamma of alpha theta to the alpha raised to the nth power, just multiplied it by itself n times, times, this would be the product of the x sub i's raised to the alpha minus 1, times e to the one, negative 1 over theta summation of the x sub i's. All right, so this would be how we would write the joint PDF of the x went out to xn, and then I just simplified, right? This is a constant, so it's just a constant to the nth power. This is a constant exponent, so I could pull the exponent out of the product. That's where you get the product of the x of i's. This is e to the, uh, this is the summation of your exponents here, because I would add exponents, and I just factored out a minus 1 over theta. Okay, if we use the factorization theorem for each of those questions that we were asked a minute ago, a, it's a little bit more, it's a little bit uglier since we have all this product stuff. But notice something. If we did the factorization theorem, we remember we break it up into a piece with x's and no 
parameter and then a piece with a parameter which if we make a substitution for a y there's no x's. So let's do that for theta here. So for theta what would we have? Well here's a piece that has x's and no thetas, right? This is for theta. This is be the piece that has x's and no thetas. So this would be the h piece. Over here, the rest has thetas, and I can see a function of the x's. So you would have the 1 over gamma of alpha, theta to the alpha, to the n, e to the minus 1 over theta, summation of the x of i's. This is your phi piece. And then this piece right here would be your sufficient statistic. Which is what we just found with the exponential form, right? This is literally what we just found with the exponential form. We saw that it was the summation of the x of i's. So again, for the theta, we break it into a piece that has x's with no thetas and a piece with thetas and look for the function of the x's in that piece. And the function of the x's in this case is summation of the x of i's. What about if we did this for the alpha instead? If we do this for alpha, we still have the same exact um, function, except I'm going to rewrite it in a different order. Uh, what am I doing? So I need e to the minus, nope, sorry. I want to write it in the same way. I just, I, my brain's not working. I apologize. x sub i to the alpha minus 1, e to the minus 1 over theta, summation of the x sub i's. Okay. This part here has x's but no alphas. So this is your h in the factorization theorem. This part has your alphas with x's, but I can define this as my y, so your y here will be the product of the x of i's. All right, so let's compare this now. So this was using the factorization theorem. I just had the product of the x of i's. Over here, we had the summation of the logs, or the log of the x of i's. Those look different, right? One with the factorization theorem, we had just the product of the x of i's. This had the log of the product of the x sub i's. But think about this. Log is a one-to-one -one function, right? So if I know the log of a number, I know what the number was. And likewise, if I know what a number is, I know what the log of that number is. So in general, what this shows us, and just thoughts in general, is that a function, excuse me, not a function, a one-to-one -one function of a sufficient statistic is still sufficient. Okay, so a one-to-one -one function of a su sufficient statistic is sufficient. So we don't get any changes at all. Okay. <clears throat> So we don't get any changes at all in the sufficiency because, think about it, if you know what the number is, you know what the log of the number is. If you know what the log of the number is, you know what the number is. It's not going to change the sufficiency thing at all. Okay? Now, you have to be careful of things. If you had, say, the squares, you'd be, you'd be a little bit careful. If there's possibles with negatives, you have negatives and positives. If you know the square of a number, you don't necessarily know what the number started with. So it wouldn't be sufficient anymore. That's why we use the one-to-one -one function. It does only have to be one-to-one -one on its support. So uh, even if you had the squaring function, but your support was only positive numbers, squaring would be okay, because if I know the square of the number, I still will know what the number is. I still know what the number is if I know that everything had to be positive to start with. So The moral of the story, though, is a one-to-one -one function of sufficient statistic is sufficient, which is why when we do things like uh, when we uh, did on the other video with the Poisson, we said the summation of the x sub i's was sufficient for lambda, 
But in general, you would use the mean, which is 1 over n times the summation of the x sub i's. The reason we use that is because, of course, lambda is the mean of the distribution. And certainly if I know the summation, I know the mean. And if I know the mean, I know the summation. So anyway, let's do a couple more examples here uh, just to do uh, enfor reinforce this exponential form idea. So look, let's look at this particular PDF. If I rewrite this one, f of x theta, I'm going to rewrite this as e to the, I'll do the natural log of this, so I'll have natural log of 3 theta plus 2 natural log of x minus theta times x cubed. Okay, this is function of theta, no x's. This is function of x, no thetas. So those are irrelevant as far as efficiency concern, is, is concerned. We're interested in this product where you have x's times thetas. So function of x, no theta. Function of theta, no x. Multiply together. So the sufficient statistic part comes out of the x cubed. So this tells us that y equals the summation of the x cubed, x of i cubes, is sufficient for theta. Now be careful, don't think you can just do the cube root and say it's summation of x of i here, because these cubes are on the individual x's. Back up here, the log was on the entire product, which is why we were able to say that the product of the x of i's was also sufficient. Notice we didn't say the summation of the x of i's was sufficient here. Okay, be a little careful with that. All right, last one. Here's another distribution. Um, I'm not even going to worry about beta equals 2. Let's say beta is known. But in particular, let's rewrite this as exponential form. So again, this piece in front, we would need to write as e to the log, right? So our f of x in terms of theta to start with, and then we'll worry about the beta in a minute. This is e to the we would have, what, log of beta plus beta log of theta plus beta minus 1x, or, uh, sorry, not x, log of x, and then minus, what is that? That is x to the beta times 1 over theta to the beta. All right. Here is... I want to put this in red again. Here is function of theta, no x's. Right? That's a function of theta. There are no x's there. Here is function of x, no thetas. Okay? Here is what we're interested in. Here's function of x, no theta, times function of theta, no x. So it's the function of x that we want for a sufficient statistic. So we have y equals the summation of the x to the beta, x of i to the beta, is sufficient for theta. So if we know what theta is, excuse me, if we know what beta is, I can figure out a sufficient statistic for theta. All right. So now we need to go the other way around. And see, the problem says, well, if you know theta, oops, yeah. Uh, no, I'm sorry. If it says if beta is unknown, can you find a single sufficient statistic for theta? So if you don't know what beta is, all right, so I'm looking over here. Well, notice that you've got some sort of inextricably linked piece here between the betas and the thetas, right? There's a piece here where they're multiplied together. I can't separate those. Plus, I've got this piece of the log of x times the beta, but I've got a piece with an x to the beta times the theta. So I'm going to have a really, really hard time here trying to figure out a function of a single function. That's why it says that again, a single sufficient statistic for theta might work. I can't get, uh, I can't do this in this particular case because I have pieces that are 
broken apart. I can't factor it correctly to get the thetas and the betas separated from each other by a single statistic. Okay, so the whole idea, uh, this should be a, I think the problem of why I'm stumbling over this is this should be a single statistic for beta rather than theta, because here's the idea. Say you knew theta but didn't know beta, okay? Now there are ways to get around if you, you could do multiple joint statistics, and they talk about this a little bit in the book, and I'm not going to be that worried about it. But notice that, remember, if we're doing exponential form here, I have to have function of x times function of beta to be able to split those two pieces apart to say where the sufficient statistic is. Well, this piece here and this piece here are have betas times the x's, but the betas times the x's here, uh, or excuse me, have beta, this has a beta times the x, but this doesn't have beta times an x, it has x to the beta. So I can't write that as function of x times function of beta to split them apart to get a sufficient statistic. So I can't find a single sufficient statistic that's going to work. Now you can do things that are joint statistics to be able to do that. And like I said, they talk about this a little bit in the book on page 501. I'm not going to be nearly as concerned with doing the joint statistics. I'm just going to be doing the ones that are single sufficient statistics here. So anyway, hopefully you'll have some time to digest this stuff. Hopefully I'll be able to talk a little bit more about more of this live. But we're going to be talking more as we go along about why we care about sufficient statistics in general. So this was just more about an introduction to can you figure out what the sufficient statistics are, and then we'll talk a little bit more generally about why we want to try to find such things. So until next time.